So please go ahead and grab some of the James Webb Space Telescope brochures before you leave, and, uh, and we'll get started. So my name is Brandon Lawton. I'm an astronomer here at the Office of Public Outreach at Space Telescope. And uh, I have the pleasure of introducing today our speaker, uh, Dr. Jason Calarine. Before I introduce him officially, though, I would like to just go over uh, a few recent Hubble news that you might have you might have seen. So, so here's a really big deal. Hubble racks up 10,000 science papers. This is quite a big deal. So in, sci in, in astronomy, like all sciences, if you don't publish, you perish. It doesn't matter if you make a discovery, uh, if you don't publish it, right? Well, Hubble has over 10,000 published peer-reviewed science papers. Okay, so it's in the upper echelon of all astronomy instruments. Okay? And you can see here from, so this is over about 21 years of life, so from the early 90s, you can see it's really ramped up per year in the number of referee science papers. Okay, so that, one, that news just came out today. Um, so here's another interesting Hubble, bit of Hubble news. We found that galaxies are the ultimate recyclers. Now this is something that we've uh, basically known about for a while. So what happens is, uh, star, so galaxies are made up of stars and gas and dust, mm -hmm. and that gas and dust forms, coalesces due to gravity and forms new stars. Okay? And what happens is over the lifetime, those stars, the more massive ones especially, will, will die off relatively fast, and they'll give their dust and their gas back out to space. What they do then is that other stars can then use that and, and make you know new stars, right? So that gas gets pumped back out into the into the galaxies, and other stars can use that to make new stars. So the galaxy recycles itself. What's a, what's really nice about this is that as stars use that material and burn throughout their life, they actually what they do is they take the hydrogen gas and they fuse it together, nuclear fusion, and they make heavier elements. Okay, and so by the time when the stars die and give off their gas they've actually given off heavier elements than when they started. Okay? So over time, galaxies become more enriched in heavier elements. Right? So this result here shows that actually those heavy elements can be found at great distances from the galaxies, and the galaxies use, those, use the uh, gas and dust to form new stars. Um, however, it depends on the galaxy how much it can do the recycling. The Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, does a great job of this recycling because it burns slowly. It forms new stars slowly. About one star forms a year, relatively slow, slowly in galaxy terms, which is great. It can use its gas slowly. Stars burn out. They put the gas back out into space. New stars can form. Okay. Um, so let me go. So how did we how did we find this? Here is I'm going to try to talk loud. I'm not near a mic, but here is a, a schematic of the Hubble Space Telescope, and here is a background what's called a quasar. So it's a very bright, a bright shining object in the universe. It's, it's a, actually a, a galaxy. It's really bright in the distant universe. And that light comes to the Hubble, but it passes through this halo around the galaxy. And as it passes through this halo, the gas in this halo around this galaxy will block certain colors of light that are associated with the elements in that halo. So by looking at this light and looking at what colors are missing from this light, we can determine what sort of elements are in this halo. Okay, around the galaxy. And we've actually been able to determine that this enriched elements from star formation around galaxies actually go out to 450,000 light years from the galaxy, which is quite far. To give you some idea, the Milky Way galaxy in diameter, full diameter, is about 100,000 light years. So that's about more than four Milky Way diameters away from the galaxy. You see this enriching. Okay, and that's quite unexpected. Um, here's another schematic that might show you this picture. So here's the scenario I talked about. You have this beautiful galaxy here, and you have infalling gas, and you have outflowing gas, and the stars in this galaxy take that gas and they make new stars. They burn, they get that gas back up. And also you see you have gas coming in from the, from the universe at large here that this galaxy can take advantage of and make new stars, right? However, like I mentioned, there, there might be a problem if you form stars too fast. And we see galaxies that do this as well. What happens is if you form stars too fast, uh, you get essentially a starburst or lots of stars burning at the same time. And that force of all those stars will push that gas away and it's driven the fuel away from the galaxy. And now it can't make new stars. Okay, so some galaxies actually um, have a starburst happen. 
Okay, so that's the tale of two types of galaxies. This galaxy is more like the Milky Way. Uh, it can run for a long time recycling gas. This galaxy is bright and burns out quick, right? So that's a good recent result. Uh, here's the last Hubble result I want to bring your attention to, which is a good segue to James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, the Hubble has found that the tiny galaxies in the early universe are absolutely bursting with star formation. Okay? So these little circles, you can't really see them in this field here, but these circles are where the objects are, and they sort of zoom in here. These are little dwarf galaxies in the early universe. So this is, these are about 9 billion years old. Okay? So 9 billion years in the past. Okay? So for the early universe, Hubble using near-infrared was able to image these. And what's amazing about this result here is that they found that the star formation in these galaxies is much greater than they expected. Okay. So these galaxies actually, these, gal these are dwarf galaxies, little galaxies, that are uh, much smaller than the Milky Way galaxy, but they double their star formation, they double the amount of stars in their galaxy from star formation uh, about once every 10 million years. Okay. That is about a thousand times faster than the Milky Way does. Okay. So these things are an example, perhaps, of the, of the in the previous slide I showed of those galaxies that are just burning stars really bright. So in the early universe, we see this as common. Okay? We see that these galaxies, these little dwarf galaxies, have so much gas, they have this massive star formation, and they blow the gas away. All right? Now, what's great about this is this is with Hubble. Okay? The further you go in the infrared, the, more, the further back in time you can probe these early dwarf galaxies. Okay? James Webb Space Telescope will be able to go even further in the infrared and will be able to look further in the past, and James Webb will shine uh, a big light on the earliest galaxies in the universe. Okay, are there any quick questions that anyone wanted to raise? Yeah. You said that the Milky Way creates a star every once every year? That's an average, yeah. Uh, about one star the size of our sun, roughly, every year. That's an average. Yeah. How do we know how many? How do we know the rate of star formation in one of these very far away dwarf galaxies? Um, they, we look for specific lines that are associated with forming stars, specific spectral features. Okay, so for example, if you look at uh, this, this may be technical <coughs> for some people, but if you look at hydrogen alpha, which is a very specific line of hydrogen emission line, we can. We can use recipes for star formation from that. Um, I don't know if, if Jason wants to give any more details on it. That's right. Yeah. I mean, this is there's no spectroscopy of these galaxies, so you're really just looking at you're looking at them with imaging and different filters, and then you you're using their colors to try and infer what the what the star formation history, what the metallicity of the galaxies is. Right. So certain objects in the universe often have the certain colors, and so. Star, so forming, star forming galaxies will have certain colors that you look for. Okay, we'll do one more. Yeah. This is on a sub different subject, I read in the newspaper then. Good. About the, they found some super large black holes. Right. And and last month we looked at the at the the, the pie chart of dark energy, <coughs> dark matter. Right. And dark matter made up something like 17% of the, the galaxy. I feel like it's about 30%. Yeah. Might that be in black holes? The black holes really are dark. No, the black holes are dark, right. Um, but the, the effects from dark matter are observed differently from what you would expect from, from just a, a black hole. Okay. How do we infer how big these are and how massive they are? The, the black holes? Yes. We infer that by looking at, there's there's different ways you can do it, but a common way is by observing how stars are orbiting around the black hole, and then you can calculate the gravity that must be within that orbit of that star. And so you can infer a mass. But, but how do we know that the, the, the gravity isn't distorting the light from those nearby stars? Well, gravity will can distort a light. You can get a, essentially, um, you can well, get sort of Doppler shifts. How do we know what we're seeing is what we're seeing is what I'm saying. 
Well, that's a very philosophical <laughs> question. <laughs> they could go to, they could go, we could be here all day. Wait, that's a tough question. Um, and I, that's above my pay scale. But, um, <laughs> um, but we, yeah. Are you saying black holes have gravity? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Okay. So, um, okay, so, so uh, a black hole is actually a star, right? So first of all, right? a black hole is a dead star that has collapsed on itself. And then when it collapses on itself, it's got uh, a, an object that has a very small size, but a very large mass, right? And so it has a huge density. And gravity is proportional to mass, right? So it'll still exert the same amount of gravity. It doesn't matter got a whole bunch of mass in a small area or a whole bunch of mass in a large area. Now, related to the earlier question, we've actually been able to make a movie of how stars are orbiting around the center of our galaxy, right? And so now with a technology called adaptive optics, where you can, you can obtain images from the ground and from space, very crisp images, you can measure how the positions of stars are changing over time right near the galactic center. Okay, and this is, I'm talking about distances that are separated by the distance between us and the nearest star to us. Over that range, you can measure the motions of stars near the galactic center. And what you can see is you can see that those stars are zipping around the galactic center so quickly that the amount of mass that's tied within their orbits has to be huge. It has to be about a million times the mass of the sun. Okay? But you don't see anything there. Right? And so therefore, you have a black hole. Now, if you want to ask, uh, of how do you know that the gravity is right, it actually turns out that in that environment, you can affect the orbits of those stars in a way that's not predicted by gravity. And that's where general relativity comes in, which is something that Einstein predicted. And when every test that we've applied to general relativity uh, confirms the observations, right? So those stars are yet another example. You know, the orbit of Mercury around the sun is, a, is an example. Mercury's orbit around the sun is affected uh, because by the sun's warp on uh, space time. And that confirms general relativity. It's exactly the prediction that you would expect. So you have to include gravity, but then in some environments, you have to add this additional term in, which is given by general relativity. Wow. Thank you. Great. And we, so we love this, this um, back and forth. So please, um, after any speaker, and he'll give, I'm sure he'll be very happy for you to interrupt him. <coughs> Questions um, as long as you're not. So. <laughs> um, and with that, let me switch over. I would like to introduce officially now, even though you, you've got to hear him speak, uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Jason Calloway. Uh, Jason was born in Canada and was raised in Canada and got his degrees at the University of uh, British Columbia. He did his postdoc work at University of California, Santa Cruz, where he had a Hubble Fellow, which at being a postdoc before my current job, I can tell you getting a Hubble Fellow is prestigious and very difficult, and uh, I'm very jealous. Um, <laughs> no, he's, a, he's, a, he's done great work, and in fact, he's been at Space Telescope now for about three years as an associate astronomer, and he's got to be one of the busiest people in the building. I, I can attest, I see him running around everywhere, so, um, if he's here. Uh, so he currently works on the James Webb Space Telescope, and you know, tonight he will give a talk on the James Webb Space Telescope entitled Science with the James Webb Space Telescope. So, Jason. Okay, so thank you very much, Brandon, for that warm introduction. <coughs> I think um, Frank should start worrying. He might take his job. Okay, so as Brandon said, I'm an astronomer here. I'm an assistant astronomer here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. I work on James Webb Space Telescope. I also conduct uh, an aggressive research program using the Hubble Space Telescope and using other telescopes from the ground. Uh, so what I want to do today is share with you um, some, some, you know, share with you some knowledge about the James Webb Space Telescope and, and uh, sort of get you guys caught up on what the next big thing happening in astronomy is. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is essentially the successor to NASA's great observatories, where the great observatories include the Hubble Space Telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope, Chandra Space Telescope, um, and, and James Webb, we're hoping, will carry forward their legacy. The great observatories of NASA have provided us with uh, 
you know, an unprecedented understanding of our uh, universe. They've, uh, they've rewritten textbooks uh, and uh, have resulted in uh, remarkable discoveries on what our place is in the universe and what the overall characteristics of the universe are. And uh, we believe they've also opened some doors and, and we're hoping that the James Webb Space Telescope uh, will, will uh, provide us with some answers. So I wanna, I wanna highlight that. So uh, let me start with this uh, picture. <coughs> it's a wonderful picture of uh, Galileo demonstrating the first telescope to the Dodge of Venice. Okay, this is the Dodge of Venice. And this is a beautiful picture because it, uh, you know, the first thing that you notice is that he's not pointing the telescope up, right? He's pointing it towards the horizon, right? And it turns out that Galileo used the telescope uh, at this time, you know, 400 years ago, uh, to convince the Dodge of Venice that this could be a valuable tool for him to spy on enemy ships. Okay? And so that's what he's demonstrating. So this guy is essentially the funding agency here for Galileo to then carry out his research with this uh, telescope. Um, until Galileo did this, uh, you know, astronomers had made a very simple observation about the universe. Right? And the simple observation, you can do this from your backyard, right? Uh, when you go to sleep, the stars are in the east, they move across the sky, and the same stars will set in the west when you get up in the morning. Get up in the morning, the sun is in the east, moves across the sky, and it sets in the west. And based on that very simple picture, astronomers put together a model of how the universe operates. And that model was very simple. It said, well, here's everything. It's moving around us, and therefore, we must be the center of the universe. Okay? And when they did this, uh, you know, that became the truth. And that became the truth uh, for a long time. Astronomers essentially took a time out for 1,600 years and didn't change that picture. Okay? And the thing that enabled that change was a telescope. The telescope was critical in motivating that change. And so here is one of the most important pieces of paper in scientific literature. And I can't actually read this. It's written in uh, Italian. But I can interpret some of the pictures. And what this is, is these are the actual notes that Galileo took um, the first time, one of the first times, that he pointed his telescope towards the sky. And one of the first objects that he looked at was the planet Jupiter, the brightest planet in the solar system. And so this is a picture of Jupiter. And next to Jupiter, Galileo sees three little objects. Uh, he comes back the next day, and he draws a picture again. And he sees that those objects have moved. And now there's a fourth one. Comes back, probably thinks he made a mistake the previous day. Comes back uh, and makes, makes another uh, picture. And the objects have moved again. And at this point, Galileo knew that he was onto a major scientific discovery, a breakthrough. And that he, he showed from these observations that these are moons of Jupiter. These are objects that are going around the massive object. And therefore, the Earth cannot be the center of the universe because the sun is more massive than the Earth. And the, and the Earth must be orbiting the sun. The sun must be the center of the solar system. Uh, here's a picture of Jupiter and one of its moons right there. Beautiful picture. And here's a close-up picture of one of Jupiter's moons. Kind of looks like the Earth, right? Lots of structure, lots of different colors. So uh, if we look at the solar system now, as we understand it, we know the sun is the center of the solar system. We've got all of these planets. Um, what I want to do is introduce a concept to you on how astronomers can become time travelers, okay? How astronomers can use telescopes as machines uh, to time travel. And this is going to be important as I start talking about JWST, okay? So if we look at the solar system, we can put a scale on this. Uh, we've measured the size of the solar system. So for example, the Earth, the Earth is located about 100 million miles from the sun. Right? Huge distance, right? 100 million miles. Hard to comprehend. Right? The planet Saturn, it's a billion miles from the sun. Okay, about 10 times further than the Earth. And our friend Pluto here, which we don't even call a planet anymore, 40 billion miles from the sun. Okay? Now it turns out that there's you know, everything in the universe travels at a certain speed, right? Uh, when Thomas turns the lights on, what, what's happening is there are photons of light that leave that bulb. Those photons start coming down. They diffract off the atmosphere, and then they come to your eyes, okay? So those photons of light are actually taking a fixed amount of time to get from there to your eyes. And that's a time that we can measure. Now, normally, that time doesn't mean anything because that time is very, very short because the speed of light is very, very fast. But when you put that time into the context of the size of the solar system, 
it becomes appreciable. Okay? So very simple math. The sun is 100 million miles from the Earth. Uh, the speed of light has been measured very accurately. It travels about 11 million miles in one minute. Okay, so that means after one minute, light has gone 11 million miles. After the second minute, it's gone 22 million miles. Third minute, it's gone 33 million miles. If you do the math, you would infer a conclusion that light takes eight minutes to get to us from the sun. Okay? Very interesting. So that means tomorrow, when you get up, you're going to have breakfast at your breakfast table. Windows are going to be open. Light's coming into the room. The conclusion here would imply that those photons of light that are coming in and lighting up your house left the surface of the sun eight minutes ago. Okay. So is this true, right? So if this is true, usually when I'm confused like this in astronomy, I try and ask my astronomer friends if this is true. And this is the part of the talk that was intended for the small kids that are not in the audience. But my first astronomer friend is Albert Einstein. <laughs> okay. And so if I asked Albert uh, if it's true that light takes eight minutes to get from the Earth to the sun, he would say, yes, yes, indeed, light takes 8.33 minutes to get from the sun to the Earth. Okay? So he's a very precise guy. If I ask my second astronomer friend, because you always want to get confirmation, uh, if I ask my second astronomer friend, let's see what he would say. So my second astronomer friend is Darth Vader. <laughs> he used to talk to me a lot. <coughs> it's changed over time. Uh, what would Darth Vader say? So he would say, ha ha, my Death Star destroyed your sun 7.5 minutes ago. Right? So what does that mean? Right? So think about this. So if light's traveling at eight minutes, light's taking eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth, Darth Vader might very well be right. Right? He could have destroyed the sun seven and a half minutes ago. We wouldn't know. Right? Okay, so this is a very simple, uh, very simple observation, very simple mathematics. And I think it'll change the way that you look at the sky. Right? Because if you start extending this analogy to the outer parts of the solar system, and you ask yourself, well, how long does light take to get from the sun all the way to Pluto? The answer is about an hour. Okay, that's how far away Pluto is. What about the nearest star? Right? It turns out that all of these planets, they're actually in our neighborhood. Right? What about the nearest star? How long does light take to get from the nearest star to us? And that answer is about four years. Okay? So space is this empty vacuum. And when you look at objects in space, you are not looking at them the way they are today. You are looking at them the way they were back in the, in the day. Okay? So if the nearest star, if light takes four years to get from the nearest star to us, when you're in, in your backyard and you look up at the night sky and you see all of these stars, some of those stars might not even be there anymore. Right? Those stars, the light took years to get to our eyes. Okay? Those stars evolve over time scales. Some of those stars that you can see with the with the naked eye are supergiant stars that evolve very rapidly. They will change on time scales of hundreds of years, thousands of years. Okay? <clears throat> so modern day astronomers use a variety of telescopes uh, to carry out their science. We go from tele we went, we've gone from telescopes like Galileo's telescope to your average backyard telescope, uh, to a small telescope that you might find in a planetarium, for example, to a professional telescope. This is a telescope that's a full grown adult right there. Right at the bottom, uh, to really large uh, telescopes. This is a Keck telescope uh, in Mauna Kea in Hawaii. I'm observing there in two weeks uh, at that same, that very telescope, Keck 1, um, to, of course, the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay? And so what I want to do now is uh, spend about five slides uh, trying to summarize some of what these telescopes have taught us about the universe, some of the key essential facts about the universe, and then segue from that to what the James Webb Space Telescope is hopefully going to tell us. Okay? And I want to back this up with some slides uh, based on pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope and also introduce the concept of a cosmic timeline so we can see exactly how far back in time we can look with current facilities and put that into context with the James Webb Space Telescope. So let me start with this beautiful picture. I love this picture um, because it's not a picture of any stars. It's not a picture of galaxies. It's a picture of gas and dust, right? I mean, how much more boring can you get, right? Gas and dust in space. Uh, but it's a beautiful picture showing all of this ionized gas in the background. And what you have here is just a column of dust uh, that is superimposed on top of that background. And that column of dust, all it's doing here is it's just blocking out the light from behind the dust so you can't see it anymore. 
Astronomers are very clever. We call this the horsehead nebula. Right? Um, so let me introduce the concept of a cosmic timeline. So when we look in our galaxy and we see objects like this, pillars of dust and gas and other uh, nebulosity, uh, how far back in time are we looking? So this is a cosmic timeline. You're going to see this on all of the next uh, five or six charts. Uh, so this is showing uh, an object that's 1,000 years away. So light's taken 1,000 years to get to us, 10,000, 100,000, all the way up to 12 billion years, 13 billion years. So 13 billion years is about the age of the universe, 13.7 to be, to be uh, precise. So when we look at pictures like this, and in fact, most pictures that you will see like this, um, you're looking back in time a couple thousand years. Okay? So light has taken a couple thousand years to get from this system to us. Let's look at another image. Beautiful image of, a, of a, something that looks like a nebula, but this is actually a picture of a star. Okay? This is a picture of something that we call a planetary nebula. Uh, it has nothing to do with planets, though. Um, it has to do with stellar death. Okay, this is what will happen to the sun in about 4 billion years. Okay? And so what you're seeing here is all of this gas that used to be tied up in a tiny little star right at the center there. And that gas has been expelled from the star and is now expanding into interstellar space. It's a classic example of the whole nucleosynthesis process that Brandon started describing. Um, and so a core part of my research is actually understanding how much mass these types of stars lose through their evolution and trying to constrain how that gas, how that material is going to impact its surroundings, its environment. So on our cosmic timeline, uh, objects like this are several thousand years away. Okay? So we're still just scratching the surface. Okay? So let's move out a little bit. Beautiful picture of a star cluster. This is a cluster of stars. So the sun, right? the sun formed in space relatively isolated. Uh, there's no stars near it within a parsec. This is a region of space where many, many stars formed uh, in a small part of space at the same time with the same properties, with the same composition. Okay? So if the Earth was orbiting one of these stars, we would actually never have night. Right? We would have different stars that rise and fall over time. That's how densely packed this region of space is. Um, so this is a cluster of stars. So when you look at a cluster of stars, when you see an astronomy image and you see a cluster of stars, remember that the light from those clusters of stars has taken tens of thousands of years to get from that system to us. Uh, in the core of a star cluster, like a globular star cluster, you can have several stars within a parsec. You can have many stars within a parsec. Parsec is three light years, yeah. I mean, the total size of the star cluster, I mean, might contain 100,000 stars and be 10 parsecs across. So it's very, very densely packed. Okay, what about this picture? So this is actually a picture of a supernova explosion. Okay, this is a picture, again, of stellar death, but in a very different regime. This is now a massive star, a star that's collapsed on itself and blown up. And when it blew up, it took all of that gas and it expelled it into its surroundings in a very violent explosion. Uh, and you see this big bubble. This isn't a screen, right? This is a three-dimensional bubble that's expanding in space as this gas is moving out from the, from the star. All of this gas used to sit right in the center of, uh, of that star. So in this case, in the supernova explosion, we're looking at an object that's you know, 50, 60,000 uh, light years away, meaning that the light has taken 50, 60,000 years to get to us. Okay? So let's move out a little bit more. What about other galaxies? This is a beautiful Hubble Space Telescope picture taken with the new camera on Hubble, the Wide Field Camera 3, showing five galaxies. And I love this picture for several reasons. So first it shows a galaxy up here, two galaxies here, a fourth galaxy here, and a fifth galaxy here. And one of the reasons this is a remarkable image is that four of these galaxies are actually physically associated with one another. And the other one has nothing to do with the other four. Right? And the one that's an oddball is this guy. Right? These four galaxies are sitting in the same region of space. These two are interacting with one another. Okay? They're actually merging. This galaxy has nothing to do with that system, but it happens to be superimposed along the same sight line. So we're looking at these galaxies, and there's another one that's sitting in front of them. Right? And it just happens to be in that part of, the, part of the sky. But radially, it's located in a complete different part of uh, space. 
So on our cosmic timeline, when we look at other galaxies like this, we're looking all the way back to millions of years, maybe 100 million uh, years. So when you look at other galaxies resolved like this, you're, the light that you're looking at with your eyes left the surface of these galaxies hundreds of millions of years ago. And then the final picture that I want to show is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, again, a very recent image that the Hubble Space Telescope uh, took. And this is a perfect example of the discussion that we were having earlier about the impact of gravity. Okay? And so what this is, is this is a cosmic lens. Okay? This is a cluster of galaxies. All of these points that you see here, are, uh, these are, this is a cluster of galaxies. So this is, a, again, a tiny region of space where there's a lot of galaxies that formed. And because of the mass of those galaxies, those galaxies have bent space around, uh, around the cluster. Okay? And what you see here is you see a galaxy that appears to show this long tail. Right? What's actually happening here is you're seeing this is a single galaxy that's located behind this, star cl uh, behind this cluster of galaxies. And because space is bent around the cluster, the light from this galaxy is warped. So the light is following the curvature of space around the cluster and being bent like this. And we can use the geometry of that bending to infer properties of the, of the cluster. On our cosmic timeline, we're looking back over one billion years. Okay? So again, astronomers can be time travelers simply by looking at objects in the universe that are further away. When you look at objects that are further away, you're looking at light that has been traveling to us for millions or billions of years and you can start to put together a picture of how things are changing over cosmic time simply by stitching together a picture of objects that are located at different distances. You can find systems like this that are at different distances and therefore light has taken a different amount of time to get to us. So let me summarize uh, you know, some of the key points of the universe that the Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes have uh, told us. So first, they've told us that our galaxy is filled with billions of stars. In fact, many of these stars have planets. I'm going to come to that in a few minutes. Uh, these stars evolve. They're born. They live. They eventually die. Uh, they interact with their surroundings. Our galaxy itself is just one of billions of galaxies in the universe. We see lots of galaxies that are like our own galaxy that are exterior to it. In fact, that was an observation made by Edwin Hubble. These galaxies interact with one another. They merge to make bigger galaxies. And recent research from less than a ten, 10 years ago has told us that the universe itself is changing and it's expanding over time, accelerating. Okay. So the James Webb Space Telescope will take this research to the next level. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope will be about 100 times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. It's the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. It'll see things that Hubble cannot see. I'll give you an example of that. It'll, be, it'll also be a cosmic time machine, but it'll be a cosmic time machine that can take us to the next level and move beyond the furthest objects that Hubble's been able to see and actually find the first stars and the first galaxies that turned on after the Big Bang. Okay. JWST will also find liquid water on other planets. I'll give you an example of that. And it'll study the formation of solar systems. So in summary, the James Webb Space Telescope is about beginnings. That's what the brochure that you guys have is. Beginnings of galaxies, of stars, of planets, and ultimately of, of life. So one of the things that I like about the James Webb Space Telescope and why I enjoy working on it is uh, I find that you know, this is a unique mission that goes beyond astronomical research. Right? The key science drivers for astronomers, right, for the mission, are intimately connected to the most fundamental questions that humans have pondered for centuries. So let me give you an example of that. The four science themes of JWST, the four main science themes that were prioritized in order to build the telescope more than 10 years ago are the end of the dark ages, the assembly and evolution of galaxies, the birth of stars and planets, and the origins of life. Right? And those four questions map you know, almost one to one with how did the universe form, is our solar system unique, and are we alone? Okay. So it's a wonderful mission in the way that it can connect with important questions we've asked ourselves for centuries. Why do we call it the James Webb Space Telescope? So it's named after James Webb. A uh, few people know this. James Webb was the second administrator of NASA. He was the administrator of NASA during the 1960s. 
Uh, he oversaw the first manned spaceflight program, which was called Mercury. He oversaw the second manned spaceflight program, which is called Gemini. Uh, he oversaw both the Mariner and the Pioneer planetary exploration programs, which are highly successful. And he oversaw the Apollo program that landed man on the moon. Furthermore, in carrying out President Kennedy's vision uh, for our country, uh, James Webb required that NASA have a component of doing science to it, that it wasn't just building uh, telescopes and exploring the, the, the universe through uh, you know, traveling uh, in rockets, but that it would have a component of science to it. And so I think we owe him a great uh, debt of gratitude, and we've named the, the telescope after him. So here's a picture of what the James Webb Space Telescope looks like. It doesn't look like your average telescope, right? There's no tubes on the telescope. Uh, and it has a very strange design. And so we're going to break this uh, down a little bit uh, through the talk. And so what you're seeing here is the, the most, uh, perhaps the, you know, the thing that stands out the, the most is this huge sun shield. And this sun shield is made of uh, five layers of material. And it's designed to always point in the direction of the sun. So the bottom of the sun shield will always point towards the sun. And what it'll do is it'll absorb the heat from the sun and keep the optics of the telescope, the glass, and the science instruments, the cameras of the telescope, very cold. And by doing this, you can observe light that's very, very faint. You can detect the faint glow that you otherwise would not be able to see if you had a hotter environment. Um, what about uh, just some simple facts about the telescope? Well, so Hubble, uh, as you know, is about the size of a school bus, right? Hubble weighs about 25,000 pounds. It's about 40 feet across. The James Webb Space Telescope is about the size of a tennis court. Okay? So this is a huge telescope. Um, it actually weighs less than Hubble, given the technology. Um, but it has a length of about 72 feet. Okay? So it's a big telescope. It's an absolute beast. The most important part of a telescope is its primary mirror. The bigger the primary mirror, the more photons you can collect from the universe. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is really sort of the next big flagship mission. So this is a uh, picture of the size of the Hubble Space Telescope, about two and a half meters across. James Webb Space Telescope is about six and a half meters across. So it's much, much bigger, much more powerful than existing telescopes. The mirrors are actually uh, one example of the amazing technology in the James Webb Space Telescope. Constructing a mirror for the James Webb Space Telescope takes about seven years, okay, from the time that the that the beryllium, the, the mirrors are made out of beryllium and then coated with a thin layer of gold uh, for reflectivity. From the time that the beryllium is mined in Utah, uh, the mirrors make about 14 pit stops across the country for different processes in the manufacturing, grinding, polishing, putting actuators on the back, testing them in cryo, uh, cryogenic temperatures, uh, and then finally getting integrated into the rest of the telescope. And so this was a huge uh, process. And earlier this year, this process was finally completed on the first six uh, mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope. And so this is a new picture of the first six coded uh, JWST uh, mirror segments entering a chamber at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama, in Huntsville, Alabama, um, and going cryotesting. This is the last phase before they get integrated into the rest of the telescope. And now the second batch of six mirrors has also gone through this full process. Um, it's really, this picture is really cool. The, the striations that you see in the mirrors here are the person's suit. Of course, it'll be focused in space. Um, one, of the, one of the really nice things about the James Webb Space Telescope is that not only can it see visible light, but it's actually optimized to detect infrared light. And one of the things that we know about the universe is that uh, visible light only spans a tiny fraction of the total electromagnetic spectrum. There's a lot more information out there. Uh, but we can't detect it unless we have detectors that are capable of studying that type of light. Um, so you know, there might be uh, much more out there than we know. And we can only pick that up if we can, in fact, extend our vision to the infrared. And so this is just a cartoon that we use in one of our explainer videos to, uh, you know, and when we talk to kids, um, in terms of actual pictures in astronomy, everybody's seen the Orion constellation, right? You can see this constellation from your backyard. There's the three stars in Orion's belt, bright supergiant uh, called Betelgeuse. This is what the Orion constellation looks like in visible light. 
What I'm going to show you now is the exact same picture taken in infrared light. Okay? This is what it looks like. Okay? All of this material that's actually there in the form of gas and dust that's being shed by these stars is completely invisible to us in the optical, in the visible band passes. But in the infrared, we can pick it up. Here's a summary of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope relative to two of our great observatories, Hubble and Spitzer. All I've done here is just plotted the total power of the telescope, uh, the square of the aperture size of the mirror, and then the wavelength that it's going to observe at. So the James Webb Space Telescope is optimally tuned to study infrared wavelengths, but it also dips into the optical overlapping Hubble and uh, dips into the far part of the infrared part of the spectrum uh, overlapping Spitzer, but much, much more powerful. How will we actually launch it? Uh, well, it turns out that it actually folds up uh, to fit inside the rocket, right? You can't launch something that's 70, you can't fit something that's 72 feet across into a, into a rocket. So the James Webb Space Telescope will fold up and fit into the top of a rocket. The rocket's actually going to be supplied by the European Space Agency. This is a collaboration between NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, and the European Space Agency. One of the many contributions of the European Space Agency is to provide the launch vehicle for the telescope. Uh, it'll also not orbit uh, like the Hubble orbits. Um, the Hubble orbits the Earth once every 97 minutes. Right? For the last 21 years, Hubble Space Telescope has been going around the Earth once every hour and a half. Okay? The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be launched to a spot that's a million miles from Earth, four times further than the moon. Okay, and there, in the dead cold of space, will it view the universe. And so this is a picture of the James Webb Space Telescope, and there's the Earth, Moon, and Sun behind it, always on the bottom side of the sun shield. The orbit time is one year. It goes around the sun. It doesn't go around the Earth. Right? The sun is, the Earth is 100 million miles from the sun. The James Webb Space Telescope will be 101 million miles. It'll be in front of the Earth or behind it? Um, away from the sun. It's the second Lagrange point. So it'll be away from the sun. Let me show you a quick little movie of how the telescope will deploy. Oops. In space. This is not going to work. I'll play this for you after. Sorry, it's not going to work. This is a little animation of how the telescope will deploy into space. I'll show, I'll show it to you after. OK, so let's start talking about the science a little bit to, uh, to, for, the, for the rest of the time. Um, so recently, what we did here at the Space Telescope Science uh, Institute is in June, we held a meeting where we called members of the astronomical community to come and share with us what exciting science drivers uh, you know, they're looking to pursue with the James Webb Space Telescope. So I was one of the chairs for this meeting. It drew an audience of almost 200 people, which is very large. Uh, you know, we have these annual meetings here, and this is approaching uh, sort of a record. Um, we had a mix of invited and contributed talks touching on, you know, very different, uh, you know, science cases. Over 40 poster presentations. We also had the PIs, the principal investigators of the different science instruments on JWST come and share some of the science that, uh, that, um, you know, that they were excited about as well. Uh, so this was a wonderful meeting for summarizing the science case of JWST as it is today. Right? A lot of the documents about JWST and its science case were prioritized uh, years ago. And this was kind of a refreshing uh, view of what science questions we want to tackle with the telescope today. And so the rest of the talk is really taking from uh, what we heard at the meeting. So let me start with, uh, with something that you probably wouldn't think of uh, when you think about the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and that is solar system science. So it turns out at NASA, there's actually a, a division between uh, space science related to solar system objects and space science related to the rest of the universe. One is called astronomy, and the other is called planetary sciences. Okay? And there's actually a formal division. For a scientist, uh, you know, that division doesn't exist. Astronomers are just as excited about the solar system science as we are for the, for the other science. And a great example of this is um, you know, the wonderful work that the great observatories like Hubble and Spitzer, uh, other telescopes have done on the solar system. This includes you know, Hubble discovered new moons around Pluto, 
Spitzer discovered the largest ring around Saturn. Uh, these telescopes have characterized dwarf planets in the outer solar system, new Kuiper belt objects, all types of science. So these are some you know, discovery images uh, of what the astronomy missions, the great observatories have provided for planetary science. So JWST will carry forward this legacy. JWST is being specifically constructed such that uh, it has a tracking system. And that tracking system can uh, monitor objects uh, with rates of motion that will allow it to study all planets and asteroids beyond Earth's orbit in the solar system. Okay, so JWST can study every solar system object that's beyond uh, Earth's orbit. So this will include you know, unprecedented probes given its resolution and sensitivity of the chemistry and the dynamics of the Martian atmosphere, uh, mapping weather patterns and thermal structures and gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. It will also image all known Kuiper belt objects in the mid-infrared and obtain the first spectra of these objects uh, over an appreciable wavelength range from 2.5 to 5 microns. We don't have this capability right now. JWST will open up this capability. And it can also, it's so sensitive that it can do this very quickly. It will obtain time-resolved imaging of dwarf planets in the outer solar system, and all types of other science cases. It will provide comprehensive tests to the formation history of the early solar system. So as we look at other planets and we look out at the universe, we'll also be understanding more about our, our very own solar system with this telescope. One of the main science goals of the James Webb Space Telescope is to look at exoplanets, okay, other planets around uh, other stars. And this is a science case that has uh, gotten stronger in the last few years. And one of the reasons it has is because of the Kepler mission. Everybody's heard of the Kepler mission, right? Kepler mission is a planet-finding mission, uh, which uh, has identified 1,235 candidate planets as of a week ago. Now it's found even more in a recent press release. And this is a nice little cartoon that shows all of those uh, planets on one picture. And so what you're actually seeing here is the star. So this is the star uh, with approximate size and color scale to the sun. That's the sun. Okay? And these little black dots are the planets. So some of these uh, stars have uh, more than one. Right? This one has three right there. Some of them have one planet. And so this is a little picture of the, sort of the demographics of planet, planetary candidates around other stars. So Kepler has been great in telling us what types of planets exist around other stars in the nearby galaxy. Okay? And the important number to take away from this is that 5% of stars host Earth-sized planetary candidates. Okay? So that's an amazing scientific result. Okay? Just yesterday, I uh, hope you guys saw this, uh, there was a huge uh, press release. Uh, it was on the front page of many newspapers. Uh, but a planet was discovered uh, called Kepler-22b. And Kepler-22b is a planet that's only a couple times more massive than the Earth. And it's orbiting a star that's only 200 parsecs from the Sun. Okay, so it's about 600 light years away. So this is a perfect planet to follow up and study to, go, to gain more information on its, on its composition uh, and on its, uh, on its characteristics. And really, to do that, you need a powerful space-based telescope. Another recent development is uh, you know, NASA is always taking ideas for constructing new missions. And one of the new missions that was recently prioritized is something called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Telescope. And TESS is designed specifically to find the types of planets, Earth-like planets around other stars, that JWST can then follow up spectroscopically. Most of the Kepler planetary candidates are too far away for JWST to study. Kepler 22b is an exception. So there's lots of different science applications for JWST in the field of exoplanet studies. And I don't want people to read this, but it's just to give you uh, an idea of the diverse ranges of modes that JWST can, uh, can look at planets with. So it can study terrestrial planets, super-Earths, intermediate mass planets, gas giants. It can use different techniques to look at these uh, uh, these planets and uh, you know yield all types of interesting uh, scientific investigations from measuring the physical structures of planets, uh, their day to night variations by studying the planets over over time, uh, you know study different elements in their atmospheres, measure their temperatures, um, all types of stuff. So there's a there's a 
lot of work for JWST to do in following up these planetary detections and confirming them and learning more about them. It's also going to be very efficient at doing this. Uh, you know, JWST's near spec instrument, which is its main spectrograph, uh, will be able to measure properties of exoplanets around nearby cool stars in just one hour. Okay? So by the time you're done your dinner, JWST might have studied another exoplanet. Uh, what about the question of whether there's another planet around another star that can have life on it? Right? That's a fundamental question that I think will change the world. Right? Um, so how do we search for this? Well, it turns out that we can use current technology. We can use the Kepler Space Telescope and we'll be able to use TESS to find planets that are of the right size and are orbiting their stars at the right distance for there to possibly be liquid water, okay? And so this is just an example. If a planet's too close to its star, it'll be cooking. If it's too cold, it'll be it, too far away, it'll be too cold. But if it's at that right radius, we could infer based on how much flux the star is releasing onto the planet, whether or not we can have liquid water or, or an atmosphere that's, uh, that's capable of studying, uh, capable of sustaining life. So JWST takes this to the next level, and it's really the only telescope that can take this to the next level. So one of the main four science goals of JWST is to characterize nearby exoplanets for signatures of water. Okay. And the way that it's going to do this is actually uh, an analogy to what uh, Brandon described earlier when he was looking at that quasar. What JWST is going to do is it's going to look at planets that are transiting their stars. And when they're transiting their stars, it's going to study the light from the star that passes through the planet's atmosphere and reaches us. And as that light passes through the planet's atmosphere, we will see features in the spectrum of the star that are missing because of the composition of the planet. Okay, it's the exact same thing that Brandon described in looking at the makeup of a galaxy's halo because of a background quasar. And JWST is optimally suited to look for features in the spectrum of the planet that looks like water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. Okay? This is actually a reflected spectrum of the Earth from the moon. Okay? So this is a spectrum, a reflection of the Earth's light off the moon. Okay? So this is what our planet would look like, a live biosphere. And what JWST will tell us is if there's other planets out there that contain these similar uh, spectral features. So absolutely amazing stuff, really pushing the limits. Okay, so here's a, moving forward a little bit, so here's a, a beautiful picture of a star cluster. Right? We talked about star clusters, somebody asked me, you know, how dense are these things? So this is one of the, this is actually the richest star cluster uh, in our galaxy. Its name is Omega Sen, it contains about a million stars packed into a tiny region of space. So with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we have the resolution to resolve individual stars as we get close to the centers of these clusters learn about very interesting dynamics that are happening in the clusters, look for black holes in the centers of these uh, star clusters, and use them as important tracers, important calibrators for many different relations in astrophysics. With the James Webb Space Telescope, we'll be able to take a small field that's right in the center of this cluster, and because of its resolution, the James Webb Space Telescope will take pictures that are sharper than even Hubble's images. Uh, we'll be able to spread out those stars over a huge, uh, over huge spaces on our detectors. And so what you're seeing here is this a new technology that was created for the James Webb Space Telescope, where not only can you image these stars, but you can obtain spectra of hundreds of stars simultaneously in the most crowded environments. And so the way that this works is that this is something called a micro shutter array. So on top of the detector, there are these little flaps, okay? And those flaps can be opened and closed by sweeping a magnet over the detector, okay? And when that happens, you can control which flaps you want to open and which ones you want to keep closed, okay? So by doing this, you can look at the barrel of a globular star cluster, a very dense environment, and you know which stars you want to get a spectrum of. In this case, it's all of these green guys. Uh, and you can open just those shutters, let that light in, get a spectrum of those stars, measure their velocities and their compositions, essentially make a 3D movie of what's happening in this star cluster. And then you can close those shutters, go look at you know, the 
galaxies that Brandon showed, dwarf galaxies in the distant universe, and open a different configuration of shutters to let in light from those dwarf galaxies. So it's a capability that allows us to multiplex our telescope and obtain spectra for hundreds of objects simultaneously. It's a brand new technology. It was created just for the James Webb Space Telescope. People are very excited about this. Finally, let me talk about the first galaxies. So recall I introduced the concept of this uh, cosmic timeline. So we're going to come back to that now. So in the 1990s, we had ground-based observatories like the Keck Telescope and other large uh, observatories that were able to take us back into time about 5 billion years, 5 or 6 billion years. Okay? So about halfway to the universe's birth. With the Hubble Space Telescope and previous instruments, we were able to push that to even further distances. In the most recent Hubble Ultra Deep Field infrared observations, we've been able to push that all the way out to a redshift that's about uh, 10, which means that the universe at that redshift is only 500 million years old. Okay, so you're looking at objects in the universe that formed 500 million years after the, the Big Bang. Now with JWST, we'll be able to go all the way. Okay? And the reason that this is interesting is that those first galaxies, those first galaxies that formed when the universe was in its infancy, that's where all the action happened. Right? That's where galaxies changed rapidly. So why do we want to measure these? So first of all, those first galaxies are the seeds of today's galaxies. They're what formed today's galaxies through merging processes. The dark matter in those galaxies was first created at that epoch. A significant amount of metals first formed. The metals that Brandon was talking about and the halos of these galaxies. If you look back into the universe so far as J JWST will, the universe was very simple. It contained hydrogen and helium. Those metals were created in the cores of supernovae, in the cores of massive stars, and then expelled into space. So this is where all of that action happened. Uh, and it also tells us when the universe was reionized and changed. So we've recently had a glimpse of what the James Webb Space Telescope might tell us. This is a recent uh, discovery by a team of astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope where they've been able to find a single Redshift 10 galaxy. Okay? And this is the image. Uh, I don't know if you'll believe it. Right? It's a single little speck in there. There's the red galaxy, you blow it up, that's what you see. That fuzzy blob is the most distant object ever discovered in the universe. Okay? It's a Redshift 10 galaxy. And so that's great. The problem is, is with one galaxy, it's very hard to constrain global relations. What we need is samples of galaxies that we can look at. So we can study whether there's differences among these galaxies, what their detailed properties are, maybe this guy's just an oddball, and also to push it to different uh, distances along the cosmic timeline. So this is a picture that we made. Uh, it might be hard to see this in the back, but this is an example of that same Hubble Ultra Deep Field that resulted in the discovery of that Redshift 10 galaxies. Uh, and we've just zoomed into a little region of the galaxy here. And this is just a simple simulation of what that image will look like with the James Webb Space Telescope. And so what you see is not only do you pick up a lot more galaxies, uh, fainter galaxies that represent the first galaxies that formed in the universe. Uh, this isn't real data, this is a simulation. But you also get a much sharper image because the James Webb Space Telescope will take sharper images than, than Hubble. Okay? On our cosmic timeline, this is taking us all the way back to right when the Big Bang happened. So this is probing the first stars and the first galaxies that formed. So we can finally complete this picture and get all the way to the, to the start. Uh, let me conclude by saying that you know, I, I decided when I was thinking of you know, what are the James Webb Space Telescope's biggest impacts going to be on astronomy, I decided to go back and do some research on what the main science goals were that justified the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay? And I had to go back to the late 70s, early 80s uh, and dig up the science document that was first written that justified the Hubble Space Telescope. So people were talking about the extragalactic distance scale, the origin and evolution of the solar system, intensities of supernovae, gas and galaxies. So what are the main discoveries of the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, it turns out that there's very little correlation between these science drivers and what the Hubble Space Telescope actually discovered about the universe. Um, 
found gamma ray bursts, measured the expansion of the universe, told us what the age of the universe is, dark matter, supermassive black holes, found new planets in the, uh, in the universe, all types of goals. And so this is telling us that when we enable new capabilities, right, the science that we achieve, a lot of it comes from discovery space, discovery space that we didn't have now. And so as compelling as I believe the science goals of the James Webb Space Telescope are, uh, you know, the four themes that we've touched on, the real discoveries of the James Webb Space Telescope may be answers that we can't even ask right now. Right? You're taking a telescope that's so much more powerful than anything that we've had before that we don't know how the entire landscape of the universe might change when we, when we uh, open up J J JWST's eyes to it. Um, if people have questions, uh, you know, we probably have the answers. I'm happy to take questions, but I also want to give you guys some resources, and I think the slides will go public, right, or they get posted somewhere. Um, and so these are a bunch of pages that, uh, that uh, where we've put material for the public, for scientists. There's lots of pictures of the James Webb Space Telescope on our Flickr page. Uh, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, we're on uh, Facebook. Uh, there's lots of information that, uh, that you can get for the telescope. So I'll stop with that.